Come enjoy the beautiful gardens here at the Indianapolis Museum of Art, today on Indiana Outdoors. Welcome to Indiana Outdoors. I'm Don Van Meter. And I'm Jill Dittmeyer. We are in the Ravine Garden at the Indianapolis Museum of Art. Later today, we're going to talk with Chris Turner here at IMA. But first of all, we're going back to school with some teachers to learn about the outdoors. Although we often think of the outdoors as a place for working or recreation, it can also be an excellent environment for teaching and learning. An example of this was a recent project sponsored by Ball State University that used the White River as a major educational resource to help high school and middle school teachers teach environmental science concepts to their students. Cooperating in this venture with Ball State was the Indiana so, Department yeah, of Natural we're Resources. More than happy to work with you. The ultimate goal of the project was to help these teachers in their efforts to produce environmentally literate students capable of using knowledge and skills in environmental science to solve real-world problems and to make personal, social, and ethical decisions throughout their lives that will improve the quality of life in Indiana. Any educational program focusing on environmental science has to be interdisciplinary, incorporating material from biology, earth science, chemistry, and physics. Discussions centering around ecosystems, dynamics of population growth, natural resource management, and the environmental consequences of human activity are important parts of such programs. Another important lesson students learn in these programs is how to use methods of scientific inquiry. Also, practice in collaborating with others to solve complex environmental problems is essential to any outdoor environmental education program. In Ball State's White River Project, teachers and students first discovered where the water in the river comes from and what factors impact the quality of river water. Soil erosion, sewage treatment plant discharges, and industrial waste are some of the sources of river water pollution. The type of land use near the river channel also influences the quality of river water. Topographical maps, subsurface geologic maps, and soil survey reports were used to learn about the land over which the water enters the river. An important part of this project involved learning how to monitor water quality. To get an accurate picture of a river's water quality, an analysis of land use along the river, chemical tests, and biological tests are necessary. The land use along the river affects the amount of water that drains into it and how fast the water enters the river, especially after a heavy rainfall. For the White River Project, teachers and students conducted nine chemical and biological tests on river water. The dissolved oxygen test measured how much oxygen, which is necessary for fish and many other forms of aquatic life, was in the water, while the biochemical oxygen demand test measured the quantity of dissolved oxygen being used by bacteria as they decomposed organic wastes. An E. coli bacteria test was used to detect the possible presence of intestinal tract pathogens that are dangerous to human health. The pH and temperature tests were to assess thermal pollution and acidity levels in the water. Tests for both phosphates and nitrates were made to monitor nutrients in the water that might stimulate excessive plant and algae growth, which creates water quality problems. Water turbidity was measured to determine the relative clarity of the water. And finally, the quantities of dissolved and suspended solids in the water were determined. In addition to the chemical and biological tests made to the river water, a search for macroinvertebrates was made. These animals include aquatic insects, snails, worms, mussels, freshwater clams, and crayfish. The number of these organisms that live in a particular river relate to the richness of the biological community. Different species react to pollution in different ways. Pollution-sensitive organisms, such as mayflies and stoneflies, are more susceptible to the effects of physical or chemical changes in a river than are some other organisms. These organisms act as indicators of clean water. 
Pollution tolerant organisms, such as aquatic worms and the rat tailed maggot, however, are less susceptible to adverse chemical and physical changes in the river, and if they are the dominant organisms present, it usually indicates that the river has problems. Another activity students and teachers in the River Project participated in was a trip to the Shekena State Fish Hatchery. This hatchery has provided fish for restocking the White River. The practice of restocking is sometimes needed when fish disappear from a section of the river as a result of natural disasters or man-made pollution. Warm water hatcheries use adult brood stock to raise fish in small ponds. When the fish reach fingerling size, they are released into the river to replenish the fish population. Well, if you get a real heavy rain, silt comes down, there you can see that back eddy over there, it's the same way. The outdoors provides not only an excellent classroom for teaching environmental concepts and about natural resource management, it also facilitates the development of an appreciation for the environment and an understanding of how much we depend on natural resources and a pollution-free environment for our well-being. More and more schools and environmental education centers are taking adults as well as children outdoors to learn. Wow, what a great way to learn. It looks like those kids and the teachers were actually yeah. having fun while they were learning. Well, that's the whole idea, Jill. Many schools and organizations use the outdoors for learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. And one of those places is the Indianapolis Museum of Art. And you can learn both indoors, but you can also learn outdoors. And joining us today is Chris Turner. He's the garden specialist. Thank you for joining us Hi, today, Chris. Chris. Thank you for coming. And a lot of people, when they think of coming to the Museum of Art, they think there's only something to see inside. But there is such a spectacular show outdoors here in the garden area. Absolutely. I mean, we have 52 acres of grounds here, 26 of which are the old fields of and over the last, say, 10 years or so, we've been restoring those gardens. And I'm sure many of our viewers have heard about the Ravine Garden here, mm -hmm. which is a one-acre wild garden from the 1920s. It has over 19,000 plants in it, and it just has an absolute profusion of spring flowering shrubs, trees, bulbs, perennials, rock garden plants. There's a wonderful water course through it. So it's really, it's really an exciting garden. Interestingly, it only, it, it's time to bloom in the spring and the fall because the families who lived here weren't here in the summertime. Oh, wow. So you do a lot of research into that type of thing to make those gardens look the way they are now as they did in the past. Absolutely. We, um, we have uh, old plans of the gardens here, photos, uh, letters from the family to the landscape architects and to builders, um, to the gardeners and such. So we, we research all of those and research other historic sites to kind of decide why we might plant certain things here. Now certain areas of our gardens are more historic, like the Ravine Garden and Formal Garden. But some areas that people might not have heard of here include our border gardens, which are, if you stand in front of the house, there's this long alley that reaches out. And on either side of those are these informal strolling spaces. And what I like to call them the gardener's gardens, yes. because they have an awful lot of unusual plant material uh, really interestingly arranged in them. Are they designed mainly for the summer or all seasons? They tend to be more all seasons, although in shady areas you'll find that there's a lot more flowers in spring, but then you get wonderful leaf textures in the summer with the ferns playing off the hostas and such. But then there are more sunny areas where we we'll incorporate annuals and tropical plants right in there with our perennials. And it's a great opportunity for people to get ideas and be inspired, not necessarily discouraged because <laughs> you go home. I ride my bike through here all the time, then I go home to my yard and I think, oh, <laughs> I wish I could have someone over there. But it's a great place to, to get inspiration. Well, sure, not everybody has 52 acres and 20 staff or so, <laughs> but um, you certainly can come here and see wonderful plant combinations, see the way that, you know, maybe Siberian irises are used in front of a knockout rose or things like that. Um, and then take those ideas home and use them. Maybe not recreate a one acre ravine garden, but recreate smaller vignettes from our property. Now, What's the favorite area for most visitors yeah. when they come? Well, I would say again, probably the ravine garden. Um, Jill was telling me that one of her favorite areas is the garden for everyone, I which is a handicapped one. accessible sensory yes. garden. And in that garden, we try and use um, fragrant foliages, fragrant flowers, uh, things that are soft to touch. We have a sculpture in there that you can touch and the sound of water and the feel of water. So not only are we trying to make it accessible to handicapped people, but we're also trying to educate everyone as to just different ways to look at gardening. Oh, absolutely. And what about the upkeep? I mean, you, meant, you mentioned you do have quite a large staff here. Is, there just, is it just constant or do they ever get a break? <laughs> well, I mean, as you would imagine, in the winter it's a little bit slower around 
around here. But we garden right up into December and we're back out there again by the end of February. We have wonderful volunteers that help us out, not only in the gardens with the pulling of the weeds and the deadheading and everything, but also with tour guides. They run the cash register in our greenhouse here. So um, we're, we're lucky to have those folks involved in the museum's gardens. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, a lot of changes have been made to this place over the past 10 years since you've been here. Mm -hmm. What about the future? What do you see for future plans here? Well, we do have some exciting expansion plans here at the museum. When you drive by now at 38th and Michigan Road, you kind of see some green and some chain link. That's going to get a dramatic new facelift over the next few years so that when you drive by, you'll go, how? Well, that's the Indianapolis Museum of Art. Um, the areas right around the fountain in front of the museum will have a new garden plaza installed around them, wow. all kinds of interesting plants in it. And it's going to be really exciting for us because it'll give us an opportunity to go beyond the historic gardens mm -hmm. and create something really modern and, and wonderful and exciting. Um, we've already been talking with the landscape architects about some really dramatic plant combinations we might include into those areas. Wow. Well, Chris, we're excited about being yeah. here. Thank you very much for inviting us. Well, I'm excited. Excited you came out. Thank Thanks. You. The subject of our next story came to Indiana from Florida and her relatives came from Siberia. Hmm, have we got you stumped? Well, then meet Bobby the Tiger Cub. Now, she's not a native to Indiana. In fact, she's a white tiger, and that's quite a rarity in the state. And you know what, Don? There are actually only about 40 or so white tigers in the entire United States. Well, Indiana Outdoors joined Bobby's welcoming crew at the Indianapolis International Airport and then followed up with a visit to her new home, Me Zoo, in Randolph County. We flew out of Orlando, I think, at about 8 o'clock. flight was supposed to be in at 10.55, and we got in early. And we asked all of the people that worked at the zoo and the volunteers, would you like to go down and meet Bobby, Paul, and Bob Taylor when they come off of the airplane? And they said, sure. And it was just such an amazing, right now I've got cold chills just waiting to see the tiger and Bobby and, uh, and Paul walking out the door at the airport coming down the, the ramp. My name is Eileen Orn and I am the owner of the Me Zoo. The, e, the Me is, was for Max, my late husband, and the E is for Eileen. And we are located right outside of Parker City, like probably 10 miles from Muncie. Well, first uh, I looked and Bob Taylor handed me the tiger, and it was like, oh, I just cannot believe it. It was one of the fun and, ex and happy experience of my life. Well, Bobby traveled really, really uh, well. It's her first major voyage, 29 days old. You can see she's not too sure about this. We talked to her about the cold weather up here, and she told us it would be agreeable with her since she's originally Siberian, so that's farther north than we are. The zoo had been going down, and Bob Taylor, the architect from Muncie, he came out, and uh, him and the students from Ball State has really, really helped us out within the last six years. He came out and he goes, Eileen, since the zoo is doing so bad, what, would, what animal do you think would really, really help the zoo and get it generating, and the people would come out and laugh and have fun again? And I said, well, I'd like to have a white tiger, but there's no way the zoo can afford a white tiger. And he said, you just start looking for one and we'll come up with the money. So we started looking and we found Bobby. Next stop is the zoo. Me zoo, we bought the farm in 86. We opened it in 87 for just handicapped and disabled. And we kept collecting animals. Paul Cross is my animal trainer, and he's been with me about six months after the zoo is open. This little girl's name's Bobby. She's a white tiger. She is a hybrid between a Bengal and a Siberian. Um, <clears throat> she was born in northern Florida at a wildlife sanctuary. She was the smallest of a litter of three. They were concerned that she wouldn't get up and get enough to eat or that she wouldn't be strong enough to roll when the tigers rolled in the den. So 
so that's why they pulled her at a pretty young age. The last last couple of days she spent at my house because it's kind of good to expose her to the people that's going to be handling her most of the time. Uh, up until then, they've, she stayed in the house at Eileen's. Um, during the day on the weekends, she stays in a baby playpen that we use for my oldest daughter in the gift shop where people can get a good look at her, but yet she can still back away enough if she's not comfortable or if she gets stressed. She's usually out for school groups uh, a couple times so that they can get a good look at her and take a bunch of pictures without having to try to take pictures through the netting of the, of the playpen. Um, she usually spends the late afternoons and evenings uh, in a room in the house with Eileen or out playing with Eileen or one of the other employees at the house during the evening. And then usually after she gets a bottle, she'll just lay down and crash for a while. As, grow, as quick as they grow, she'll spend a lot of time sleeping just so she can be growing. The white tigers were the ones that were originally brought in from the wild in the early 50s were Bengals. So she's got a lot of Bengal in her. And the mother that I saw of her was probably doing, would do good to make 300 pounds. Um, the father she's out of is white, and he's probably closer to five and a half, 500, 550 pounds or so. So with being a female, she won't get quite as big as him, but we're hoping for all three and a half, 400 pounds anyway. We hope that um, with her coming to the zoo, it'll bring us another opportunity to educate children on the plight of the endangered species in general in the wild. Um, the white tiger per se isn't really covered by the Endangered Species Act because it's a hybrid between a Bengal and a Siberian most of the time. But tigers in general are still very endangered in the wild and their uh, natural habitat becomes less every day. And I guess one of our big goals is that we can use her with the interaction we'll be able to do with her to educate the children and have them help them remember a little bit. Plus, we'd like, uh, we hope that people will come out to see her, oh, every year and watch her grow. How oh, with Bobby the Tiger is really a really big thrill to have a Siberian white tiger. It's the, as far as I know, it's the only one in Indiana, so that really, really makes me proud and happy. And to think that I would have a friend that would be willing to give up a lot of money to buy a white tiger. Bobby and the folks at Me Zoo will help educate children about endangered species. You can get driving directions to visit Bobby or arrange a field trip by calling Me Zoo. Here's their number, 765-468-8559. Our final story today is on migration. Often birds come to mind when we talk about migration. Mm -hmm. But as a biology professor at Ball State University tells us, fish and insects migrate too. Migration is generally uh, defined as a two-way movement from point A to point B and then from point B back to point A. When we try and unravel the mysteries that deal with navigation, with migration, there are four basic questions that scientists are very interested in finding out. The first one is, where do birds go? The second question is, how do they get to the place where they're going? So the third question is, how do they prepare for this migration? how much weight do they need to put on in order to be able to undertake these incredibly long journeys in some cases. And then the fourth question deals with why do birds migrate? We have a lot of answers now to some of these questions, but there's still a lot of mysteries. Birds are not the only organisms that migrate. There are many other groups uh, that migrate. Uh, for example, we have salmon, um, especially on, in the Pacific part of the distribution, there are several species of salmon that migrate. We also see migration in huge herds of caribou, especially up in Alaska. And then also we have examples in the insect world. Monarch butterflies migrate from the western parts of the United States into uh, parts of Mexico. 
there have been several projects where these butterflies have been tagged. And so if we make observations along their migration route, we're able to determine where they go. We participate in a program called Monarch Watch, people that join and become members to tag monarchs. Um, the reason we tag is, well originally they started tagging in 1938 trying to find out where monarchs overwinter. Um, they discovered that overwintering site in 1975 to the mountains north and west of Mexico City. And they have continued to tag to this day to answer other questions such as why do they migrate, how do they know when to go, um, how do they know the way, um, things like that we're curious about. We've already caught this one and the first thing you have to do is get it out of the net and you want to fold the monarch, make sure his wings are folded, kind of hold him. Put your hand in the net and you grab him by what we call the leading edge. You get a tag, a sticker ready, and they're just little stickers. Just like that. Nice quick tap to make sure it's stuck. You need to record that tag number and that's the bottom line. And it says 805WD. We record that on our data sheet. And that's it. Monarchs are the only butterfly that migrate and they migrate to Mexico, the mountains north and west of Mexico City. And it's really neat to see if your monarch makes it to Mexico. It is remarkable how uh, an insect that, that seems uh, so vulnerable is able to make these very long distance migrations. The second group of migrants uh, are short distance migrants and we've got definitely some examples uh, here in Indiana. The reason why American crow, some of those populations from the north join Indiana is that it's just too cold for them there's usually not enough food supply. And so even though we think of Indiana as being very cold for us as humans, uh, many of these birds can survive just fine. They find a lot of food uh, sources right here in Indiana. Organisms migrate because there is a reduction in the food supply during the winter months. And so if you look at most of the migrants here in North America, uh, these are birds that rely very heavily on insect and as food and that's the main food source for them. During the winter time there's, there are no insects. They either die or they overwinter and much more difficult to um, find. And so food is the limiting resource and that is what triggers uh, birds to migrate. The immediate cue that gets a lot of birds to start migrating is either an increase in day length and that would involve migration heading north during the springtime or a reduction in the day length during the fall. The best way to envision this increase and decrease in day length is to think about going to school. If you're out there early in the morning during the winter time and you're waiting for the school bus, it's usually very dark. And then as we progress into spring, when you're there at 7 o'clock or 7.15 to catch your bus, all of a sudden it's light. And that would be one way to try and visualize that the amount of daylight or the amount of night is not constant and that changes over time. When we look at navigational cues, we find that there are four areas that birds make use of. For example, following mountain ranges, which generally run north-south, uh, following some of the major river systems and lakes and so on. These would be some landmarks that birds can follow. A second group of cues that birds make use of are the Earth's magnetic fields. A third area would be to look at celestial cues, and these would include during the daytime the position of the sun and during the nighttime the position of the stars. And then a fourth one that's very poorly understood is some birds may very well use smell as a navigational cue to get from one point to the other. So these would be the four major areas uh, that birds use to navigate. When we see certain organisms during certain times of the year and then they're gone the rest of the year. And so I think that's part of human nature uh, is that curiosity, where do they go? That is one uh, question that we've been trying to answer for many years. Uh, we have a lot of answers now to some of these questions, but there's still a lot of mysteries. Well, Jill, I think it's time for us to migrate, too. I think so. We hope you've enjoyed today's show. We'd also like to thank Chris Turner and the Indianapolis Museum of Art for hosting us today. And we hope you join us next time on Indiana Outdoors. Bye, everyone.
Look at these plants. Oh, these are gorgeous. Yes, look at the different textures oh, yeah. we have here. Indiana Outdoors can be used as an educational tool in the classroom or at home. If you'd like a copy of the program you just watched, call 1-800-252-WIPB or send a check or money order for $10 payable to WIPB-TV. Mail to Indiana Outdoors, WIPB-TV, Ball State University, Muncie, Indiana, 47306. Be sure to note today's program number on the screen. If you would like to learn more about Indiana Outdoors or the natural resources and recreational opportunities in this state, check out our website at www.indianaoutdoors.org. Meet the staff. Preview upcoming programs. Find out which stations carry the show and when you can view it. Send us your comments on email from this website. Let us know what you think of our show.